To moderate our next panel, the Space Foundation is honored to welcome back General Howell Estes, former commander of Air Force Space Command and a life director of the Space Foundation. He has gathered two other distinguished retired flag officers for what promises to be a provocative panel oriented on space support of the warfighter. General Estes, we look forward to your panel. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, let's see, I see six or seven. Oh, eight or nine, maybe. This is good. Thanks very much to the, those of you that uh, stuck around this afternoon uh, for this panel. Um, I'm sure many of you have been to space symposiums before. I've been to lots of them, of course, over the years. Um, one of the things I found is that at the space symposiums, uh, one of the things that Elliot Pulliam and his people do is to try to create new information so that you don't hear the same thing year after year. I think uh, this particular symposium, I've been to a lot of the panels that, and speeches that were given today, and I think that Elliot has accomplished that purpose, and hopefully this panel will be something a little different than what you're normally used to when you come to a space symposium. I say that for two reasons. Uh, the first is, um, you can see we are not following the AT&T ad of bigger is better. Smaller is better in this case. We're only the three of us today. Uh, and that's gonna give us a chance to talk in a little more detail about some of the issues we want to raise with all of you today and have a dialogue about. Uh, the second thing is the title of our, uh, of our panel is Delivering Improved Space Capability and Effects to the Warfighter. Uh, what we want to do today is you know, broaden that horizon just a little bit, open up the aperture, because what we do at the Space Symposium, as the name uh, suggests, is we tend to talk exclusively about space. Uh, you're getting a little bit of a mix in the panel that was before us. Uh, earlier today, talked about disaster relief and sort of how it impacts, impacts the larger aspects of disaster relief. What we're going to try to do today is not just talk about additional things that space ought to be doing, but open the aperture and talk about generally uh, operations of U.S. Uh, military forces. Uh, I know we have a lot of uh, foreign countries here. I applaud the fact that the Space Symposium is broadening its horizons a little bit in that regard as well by uh, having uh, a more of an international audience here. And so I applaud that um, some of you stopped by today to listen to this uh, discussion as well because a lot of it involves not just the United States uh, doing what it has to do for defense, but also how we do it with our allies uh, in, in the interest of our, of our nation's uh, uh, vital interests and vital uh, concerns around the world. So with that sort of as an opening uh, a comment, uh, I will, before I introduce our panelists, uh, sort of set the stage for the discussion uh, this afternoon. Uh, I don't need to tell this particular audience, uh, especially of those of us from the United States, that we're in a uh, terrible fix with, with the defense uh, budget, with our budget in general as a nation. Um, we've been spending too damn much money, which we would never do as individuals, but as a nation, we've spent more than we were bringing in, and we've got ourselves in a hell of a fix. And so we've got to do something about it. Uh, we've heard a number of speakers talk about this today, uh, but it sort of sets the stage because the changes in defense spending are in fact going to change the way defense has to operate for the United States, and again, I say with our allies. Um, cuts have already been made in the $480 billion level for the next 10 years. Uh, we know sequestration has taken hold here in this country now as of the 1st of March. Uh, we're slowly seeing some impacts of that. Hopefully we will get some budget resolution before the impacts go too far but, uh, but that remains to be seen, and we, we again heard people talk about that earlier today. But the fact remains that we've already got in the neighborhood of a half a trillion dollars in cuts coming that have already been agreed to. We're probably gonna see in another in the neighborhood of $200 billion in cuts. So the combination of the two means around $700 billion plus reduction in the U.S. defense budget over the next 10 years. That's, that's real money, and it's going to force U.S. defense to operate differently than we have in the past. 
So the resources are changing, but the mission isn't going to change or hasn't changed. You know, the, the U.S. military is still going to have to provide for the common defense. That's a part of our Constitution. It's also going to have to protect vital U.S. strategic interests around the world. And again, I say with our allies, with so, such an important part. So this creates a whole new set of challenges. And we, for years, have been talking about as we see these budgets fluctuate, we got to do more with less. And we've heard that time and again. Well, folks, this time we really are going to have to do more with less if these budgets hold and if these reductions take place, which uh, I think I personally am convinced, convinced they are because the U.S. has got to visit, fix its overall budget problem. To be effective in this resource-constrained environment, We've got to do, I think, three things at least. First of all, we've got to find new ways of employing joint forces. Uh, the U.S. military has talked about jointness. We've been talking about it for at least a couple of decades. Uh, at first, it was, I think, a lot of rhetoric. Uh, lately, we've seen, because of the conflicts we've been involved in as a nation, we've seen the joint forces coming together in a much more effective way. But we're going to have to make another, I think, significant leap beyond where we are today in the employment of joint forces as these budgets start to reduce. We're also going to have to think about the tools of the defense trade and, and the challenges that they bring. And the things that worked in the past are not the things we're going to need in the future. We're going to have to have different tools to be effective as a joint force in the future. And lastly, one of the things that uh, any military is concerned about is creating an Achilles heel somewhere. So we've got to be sure as we look at how we're going to operate that we're not creating Achilles heels and that we're not uh, creating critical nodes that we can't protect, that are not assured, and that are not redundant. We don't want to make it easy for somebody to uh, uh, quickly affect our ability to operate. If you think back at the end of the Cold War, there was a lot of discussion in the United States uh, at the political level about shifting our look that uh, we watched Europe for so long uh, and the um, engagement between the Warsaw Pact and the NATO forces. Uh, as the Cold War uh, diminished and basically was eliminated and things changed significantly in that part of the world, the United States at the political level said it's time to shift our focus to the Pacific Asia, Asia Pacific area because of the interest that this country has there. Uh, and so that started to take place. And then what happened, 9-11 came along and the focus quickly shifted to counter terrorism around the world, especially in the uh, Persian Gulf area. We found ourselves uh, tied down in Iraq and then Afghanistan. And so we didn't make that shift to the Pacific that was talked about in the late 90s. Um, the conflict in Iraq obviously has uh, ended, at least in terms of US direct involvement. Uh, we're reducing forces now in Afghanistan. And uh, the, our country, the United States, has made some commitments for troop reductions and withdrawals uh, in the next uh, 12 months or so. Uh, we'll see how all that sorts itself out, but nevertheless, we are significantly reducing forces. And so you once again hear the political powers of the nation, the, the leaders of the country, talking about shifting away now from the Persian Gulf area and thinking back about where some vital strategic U.S. interests are in the Asia Pacific area. So what does all this mean, uh, this shift to the Pacific? Uh, how will we do it? Will the strategy that the U.S. comes up with be critical? Uh, and and will it, be, it will be critical, but will it be credible? Um, how in the world are we going to protect the U.S. strategic interest, uh, the interests of our allies in such a vast area? Uh, you saw an earlier, if you were here earlier, uh, there was a, a young Army officer from the uh, PACOM staff here talking about disaster relief. She showed a picture of the air responsibility for uh, the PACOM, uh, the Pacific uh, Command Forces, uh, the joint forces there. It's vast, it's huge. 
compared to any other region that we have to deal with. So how do we go about dealing with that very, very large area and U.S. and allied uh, security interests there? The, these are but a few of the questions that our national leaders in this country are, are dealing with uh, and, the, uh, and, and what to do about them. To complicate uh, this matter, um, in the last decade or so, there's been a new thing called anti-access area denial. Uh, the sh short version of that is A2AD, and threats in this anti-access area denial are starting to emerge, and they're challenging the U.S.'s ability to operate the way we've operated in the past, which is when we see a conflict starting to form up and we have a, an area where we've got to go uh, take some action, we deploy fairly significant forces there uh, before anything starts, and we're able to move significant forces forward, uh, be they Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marine. Uh, this anti-access uh, area denial threats are going to prevent us from moving those forces forward. So that's a significant change in the way the U.S. is going to have to operate in the future. The uh, sanctuaries we've had on air, land, sea, and space, and in cyberspace that we've enjoyed basically since World War II are now at risk, uh, and that's going to change the way we're going to operate. To carry out the strategy associated with our shift to the Asia-Pacific region, operational concepts are being developed to deal with these issues. One of them is called air-sea battle, and some of you here have heard about that here in the United States. We've been talking about it for some time. It's a joint uh, uh, discussion going on between the United States Navy and the United States Air Force about how they will jointly operate to deal with some of these issues in the, in the Asia Pacific uh, region. So here today to talk about what I've just sort of discussed in a very general way are two uh, uh, well-known uh, defense experts uh, who I will introduce now. The first is Admiral Mark uh, P. Fitzgerald, United States Navy, retired. Uh, and uh, Mark is the president of Argoso uh, Global, and it's a consulting firm uh, for numerous defense, commercial maritime, and aviation uh, companies and contractors. Uh, he is also the chairman of the board of the Association of Naval Aviators. Mark has logged over 4,800 flying hours, uh, this, this next statistic always amazes me. He has over 1,100 uh, carrier arrested landings. I mean, I wouldn't even want to do one, <laughs> you know, uh, if, you, if, you're a, if you're a flyer. I like a nice wrong, long <laughs> runway. Uh, so he's done 1,100 uh, carrier landings <laughs> off the decks of uh, 13 different carriers. Retired from the United States Navy in 2010. Uh, at that time, he was the commander of the U.S. Naval Forces Europe, U.S. Naval Forces Africa, and the commander of the Allied Joint Forces Command in Naples. Our second uh, panelist, uh, known to many of you, and, and Mark may have been as well, but probably a little more familiar from an Air Force standpoint, is Lieutenant General David A. Deptula, a United, Air Force, Air, United States Air Force retired. He's the president of... Uh, uh, a strange company called the Deptula Group. <laughs> um, while uh, and it's, it's a company that, uh, uh, that serves, and he serves as the primary representative from that company on a number of, of uh, public, private, and uh, think tank boards. While he was in the Air Force, he did a number of things, as, uh, as Mark did in the Navy. I'm just going to mention a few of the things that, that Dave did uh, where you might recognize his name from. He was the uh, principal attack planner for Operation Desert Storm, the combined air campaign there in 1991, uh, serving uh, obviously directly for General Schwarzkopf and uh, General Horner, the air combat, uh, the air component commander. Uh, he was also the commander of the combined task force Operation Northern Watch uh, during a period of renewed Iraqi aggression in 1998-1999 and there he flew over uh, 82 combat missions uh, in support of uh, those operations. He was the Joint Force Air Component Commander for Operation Uni Unified Assistance, which provided relief for the uh, South Asia tsunami in 2005. Uh, 
Dave retired from the U.S. Air Force in 2010 as the first Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance in the Air Staff in the Pentagon. That was a brand new position uh, which the Air Force formed. You may recall we used to have sort of a director of just intelligence. We combined all that together in, in the uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance area. And as I mentioned, Dave was our, our first uh, uh, deputy commander there for, uh, for the chief of chief of staff of the Air Force. So with that very brief introduction and uh, my sort of setting the stage for uh, their comments, I will ask Mark to come up and then Dave to give you some, uh, give you some thoughts and then we'll open it up to questions and get a dialogue going on this. Okay, Mark, thanks, thank so. you. Well, good afternoon. Hopefully uh, we're the only thing keeping you or between you and a beer, but um, it's great to be out here. This is my first visit to the Space Symposium and uh, quite a show out here. And it's great to be amongst the space junkies, so to speak, out here. Uh, I would have to say to that, you know, my name is Mark and I'm a space abuser. And I say that because of the J6s and N6s of the world that I have uh, crossed paths with. Uh, when my C2 is not working properly. And, you know, as you get older in life, and uh, as many of my colleagues out here have mentioned, uh, what do you know about space? Um, I used to think of space as an enabler, and it enabled me to do my business. And I think I now think of space as an integrator in a way of integrating my command and control and, and making things happen. So with that as a, a thought, um, the trends that we're seeing out there today and our potential adversaries, uh, there's, there's no surprises here. Their ISR is extending out. They uh, are able to do all source uh, intelligence gathering and their vision and knowledge of our activities and their understanding uh, grows on an exponential basis from the past. The weapons that they're able to bring to bear on a fight are disaggregated, so they're not a mass-on-mass -mass force anymore. Those disaggregated weapons can be delivered from a, a, a long way away from deep inside their own territory, and they can be brought uh, in mass uh, to the point of attack. Um, sounds a lot like what we're trying to do. Um, all sectors of the warfighting spectrum are in play these days, and that includes cyber, that includes space, uh, as well as, of course, the conventional side of the, the uh, equation. And all of this combines, as Howell says, to, to change the way that we will have to fight in the future. Uh, every war that we fight is different, and the future will be no different than that. Uh, as our rare areas are held at risk, it'll force us to fight from longer distance. It will force us to disaggregate and force, and force us to rely more and more on our networks. When you look at our national strategy, which obviously is very critical that we have free access to the global commons, this anti-axis area denial capability uh, really starts to challenge us as a nation in our economic well-being and the way that we want to operate in the world. And so uh, it affects our strategic mobility and it uh, is, allows them to hold uh, key pieces of the global commons at risk uh, so that we are not able to operate there, uh, denying us that, that freedom of movement. So our response has to be multidimensional. It has to, as is said in many documents, do offense in depth, be able to strike near and far, and be able to hold the enemy's uh, key infrastructure and, and centers of gravity at risk. So when you look at what's being developed out there, um, it's not we're gonna go fight China, we're gonna go fight Russia. It's what systems are being developed and as they proliferate through the rest of the world, how are we gonna fight in the future? Look at detection capabilities, the ISR, the ground wave radars, the space-based intelligence collection. Uh, 
all starts to make us make the battle space more transparent. Uh, advanced missiles uh, of longer range, uh, Korea, as we look in the papers today, is a prime example. Uh, the, the aircraft systems and the surface to air uh, weapon systems all start to build this anti access capability uh, for a nation that wants to hold key pieces of, of the global commons at risk. So while we may never fight a full up enemy, we will probably fight uh, those systems in some way, shape, or form, and we've got to figure out how we're going to do that in the future. So getting the requirements right here is going to be absolutely important to our national defense. And as Hall has outlined, our, as our budgets continue to shrink, we don't have the capacity or the capability to just go out and buy and buy as we have done in the past. We've got to be smart in how we do this. The Joint Staff has put out a, a joint operational uh, access comment, which uh, is to go after this counter the uh, anti-access area denial uh, strategy, and that's the operational level document that the forces are, are beginning to coalesce under. And of course, the Navy and the Air Force have set up the air-sea battle concepts, which is a con ops underneath that, uh, that JOAC that allows the, uh, the, the program as the requirements generators to start to get their hands around how they're going to economically go after this and how the Navy and the Air Force can partner together and start to get the synergy required so that we get those savings and still buy the systems that we need. So when you listen to the uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force and the Chief of, the, Chief of Naval Operations talk, they talk about air-sea battle being a networked, integrated, and attack-in-depth force. Well, as I've already mentioned very in, in the front of my comments, the first two of those, networked and integrated, are right in the wheelhouse of space. They're the things that we are going to have to do in the future. And space as an integrator is going to have to get, not just say they're a warfighter or an integrator, but they're going to have to get down and make sure that the systems that space are delivering are systems that are, one, useful to the operator, two, are integrated into the operator's con ops, and number three, are able to not overload the systems, but to add value to the systems. And I'm not sure we can say that today about the systems that are out there. So when I look at air-sea battle, I think there are three imperatives that, uh, that, that, that change the dynamics of the way that we do war fighting. Uh, number one, countering the ballistic and, and cruise missile threat. When you start talking ballistic and cruise missiles, they don't have to be fired from the, uh, from the main battle space. They can be fired from deep within the enemy's territories, uh, and they can bring mass to the fight uh, from very disaggregated positions and, uh, around the, around the uh, country. So people say, well, the Scud Hunt during Desert Storm was a complete failure. We couldn't kill a single one. I would argue the Scud Hunt and Desert Storm was a complete success because what happened? The most they could put in the air was a couple of missiles. There was never a large salvo launch that would take down any of our infrastructure. And so as you start to extrapolate that out into future warfare, how do we get deep enough into the battle space with our, uh, with our unmanned aircraft, with our, our uh, stealth bombers, our follow-on B-2 uh, long-range strike, weapon system, our surrogates, our, our stand-in jammers, our, uh, our other unmanned uh, weapons and, and aircraft that we will have in the battle space. How do we get in there and, and uh, set up this self-forming network that's going to be able to use the synergy of all of those forces in a family of systems in order to, uh, to, to take down the threat and to do that uh, take down the, the cruise missile, take down the ballistic missile uh, sites. I would contend that it's going to have to be a very integrated approach that involves cyber and will involve electronic warfare. It's going to involve time-critical strike. And hopefully, 
by the time you do those kind of things, you will reduce the salvo size to a small enough uh, size that you can go after them with our space-based interceptors, with our point defense and area defense uh, terrestrial interceptors, so that we can get that, uh, uh, we can stop that large salvo from, from inhibiting our force. The number two imperative of this air-sea battle in the future, I believe, is going to be the ability to operate in a highly contested electromagnetic environment. And that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. But I would say you've got to be able to hide in plain sight. You've got to be able to manage the electromagnetic spectrum so that your comms, your electronic signature, uh, all the things that you do in that arena are either masked within the electronic spectrum or somehow do not expose you in the future. And uh, that involves everything from space-based systems to terrestrial systems to ground systems. And then the number three imperative is command and control. How do you do that within this extended battle space? Uh, the KOC model may not be the best model for doing this. We may have to have local battle managers who, in that self-forming network, take control and carry out the commander's intent. And how do you do that? How do you form that network? And how is that network informed from, the, uh, from space and from the rare areas uh, so that the information required to do the mission is available? So in that deep battle space, I think unmanned systems are going to continue to grow and grow. They're going to play a key role in delivering those effects deep. Uh, and the effects are anything from the initial prep of the battle space, the ISR prep, to uh, weapons delivery. And weapons delivery does not necessarily mean kinetic weapons. It can certainly mean cyber effects, electronic warfare effects, or, uh, or other kinds of effects. Um, the communications are going to have to be secure. Uh, we're starting to take the steps that way with the uh, adva advanced EHF systems, but we've got to continue to harden, uh, harden those, both those space-based and terrestrial communications. They've got to be redundant. We've got to allow for graceful degradation of things like GPS and, and comm systems. Uh, we've got to be able to get the network so that they're self-healing and self-forming. And we've got to be able to hide within that electromagnetic spectrum. I believe that we've got to be able to get all source ISR information to the warfighter in a time critical fashion. Right now, we can pump it out, and we can pump it out, and we can pump it out. But you can overload one guy in one airplane so quickly that that information becomes useless. So how do we tailor information and how do we get it from the space grid into the terrestrial grids so that it becomes useful tactical information and not just strategic information that uh, uh, doesn't help the guy that's on the tip of the spear. And then local battle management uh, is going to be absolutely critical and how are we going to do that in this uh, contested environment. So when you start thinking of the space capabilities that are required to do that, uh, communications, uh, how do we look beyond AEHF to maybe laser communications to hub and spoke kind of setups, uh, and how do they interface into those terrestrial networks? For ISR, how do we make sure that we have a tactical information grid that is not just a data dump uh, for GPS, how do we get beyond uh, a jammed GPS system and, and what is the graceful degradation from that? And of course, how do we implement cyber at a tactical and operational level uh, so that it is synchronized with the strategic campaign? So I hope I've, I've tweaked some questions there. I hope uh, we can have a good dialogue on that. And as usual, I end up being the setup man for Dave Deptula here. So I will turn the mic over to him. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Nice job. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it really is a pleasure and a privilege to be here today. And let me start right up front by thanking each and every one of you, because you all are truly the hardcore uh, to be here listening to us instead of uh, 
you know, having a beer or a whiskey over in the bar. So we appreciate that, and we know that you all are the ones that are really interested in, uh, in going on with this dialogue. So I'm, not, I'm gonna try not to talk too long, but maybe throw out some thoughts and ideas that can, uh, as Lobster said, stimulate some discussion. Now, General Estes laid out for us uh, basically the challenges of this very, very complex security environment that we're moving into, um, as well as uh, briefly outlining the, what we all know so well are the, the resource constraints and then talking a bit about the uh, strategies uh, that uh, are ever evolving in how to deal with these two very uh, complex elements. Uh, and Admiral Fitzgerald went into some uh, detail outlining the A2, AD threat, air sea battle, uh, and the challenges surrounding each. So what I'd like to do is basically expand upon their comments, uh, but do it from a couple of related perspectives. Uh, the first one being to emphasize the fact that we're really at a turning point in the conduct of warfare based upon uh, the modern technologies and increased processing power uh, that we have. And two, that um, that's good timing because we are not gonna be able to afford to conduct warfare uh, in the paradigm that evolved over the last century. However, to achieve the objectives of obtaining superior U.S. warfighting capabilities um, at less cost is going to require more than new technology, adjusting manpower, or altering the number and types of widgets that we decide to buy or not buy. And we're certainly not going to meet these challenges of the future by simply buying less of what we already have. It'll require applying new concepts of operation those that are enabled by information age capabilities in new and different ways. Information-centric, interdependent, and functionally integrated operations are what I believe are the keys to future military success. Now this is gonna require an agile operational framework for the integrated employment of military power. It's going to entail a shifting away from the conduct of warfare segregated by the separate domains of air, sea, land, space, and cyberspace. While still retaining those competencies, that's very important, and this is going to be a complex shift, because you need to maintain the competencies of being able to master operations in those domains but shifting to truly integrated operations based on the functions of what I suggest are global situational awareness, strike, maneuver, and sustainment. Linking operations across all domains with accurate information can be the basis of what you heard Lobster and General Estes refer to in terms of a omnipresent security complex that's self-forming, and if attacked, self-healing. This kind of complex could enable a conventional deterrent effect that would induce stability wherever it was employed or achieve decisive outcomes if it came to force application. The whole notion of this idea is cross-domain synergy. The complementary versus merely additive employment of capabilities in different domains such that each one enhances the effectiveness and compensates for the vulnerabilities of the others. Examples already, always help, so let me give you a simple one. And that would essentially be, if you take a look at some of the denial aspects to the advantages provided us by space, using a long-range ISR strike aircraft capable of operating in contested airspace, to cue Aegis fleet missile defenses to engage adversary anti-ship missiles launched against US aircraft carriers. Again, a simple example, but as all of you in here know, the ability to provide those linkages and create that outcome uh, may sound simple, but it's very, very complex in actuality. Now for some, the image of network-centric warfare suggests an over-reliance on digital systems and centralized switching and focus. I'd suggest that the opposite is the reality. It's about enabling disaggregated, distributed operations over a fluid operational area. 
It's about combining digital tools with effective distributed decision making, not centralized. And it's more akin to putting together a honeycomb than a network. And obviously operations in, from, and through space are gonna be at the heart of this complex. Now the kind of complex that I'm talking about is not just about things. And that's really my underlying point here. It's about integrating existing and future capabilities with an agile operational information framework that's guided by human understanding. It's an intellectual construct enabled by technological infrastructure, and quite frankly, it's eminently affordable, but it's gonna require a paradigm shift from thinking in terms of individual unit cost or input measures to thinking about cost per desired effect or output to assess real value. So with those thoughts, um, I'm gonna pass the mic back over to General Estes and hopefully that stimulated some thoughtful questions and we can move forward in this dialogue. Thanks again for being here this afternoon. Good work, Dave. Well, we're going to hold a uh, discussion here, and we will try to get to your questions if you have them. I don't see any on the screen here, but, but I do have some thoughts that might uh, trigger some discussion from the audience a little bit, too. Um, you know, the, the, us talking about these general ways of operating differently in the future are tied right to what General Shelton was talking about this morning when he said, you, you know, this budget climate is going to drive us to operating differently. It didn't clear to all of any of us who are still engaged in this in a very uh, significant way, uh, not on behalf of the government directly, but just as retired folk. Um, it, it's, it's obviously of interest to us, and we've been doing a lot of thinking about this. Um, and one of the things that immediately comes to mind when you talk about we're going to do things differently, we're going to operate our forces together in a different way, is that, boy, does that sound, I've heard that story a hundred times. What is going to be different this time than in the past? Because when the budgets get tight, the services, Army, Navy, uh, Department of the Na Navy, Department of the Army, and Department of the Air Force, all hunker down and try to protect what they have. That's the history of what goes on. Don't give anything up here. Take something away from somebody else to make sure that we at least get our fair share. So when we talk about air-sea battle and the Air Force and the Navy in particular operating together, it seems to me that the resource constraints make that very hard for the services to do. So with that thought in mind, let me see what, the, what, the, what, what co comments we may get from Mark and Dave on that about how in the world we're going to do things differently uh, in the future as the budget gets tight and the services start to operate in a way which we've seen them operate many times, which is protect what you have and don't give anything up. Thanks, Hal. Um, you know, the, the, there are... There are some very positive signs here. First of all, I think air-sea battle gets to the root of one of the, the major problems that, that have plagued all the services, which are uh, how do we have interoperable communications, interoperable networks, those kind of things. And I, I truly believe that the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army really do want that. And so when you start to see the air sea battle office form in Washington, and it's really focused more on the architecture than it is on the hardware, um, I think that's a very positive sign. And if we can uh, move forward and get to, to standards and to architectures that are common, obviously you drive the, uh, you drive the cost of those systems down. Uh, we used to like to say using other people's money in the Pentagon, and I think that's essentially uh, what you see there. Uh, on top of that, I think the threats uh, around the globe are so great that the services all understand that it's not a go-it-alone kind of, kind of warfare, that everybody's going to have to rely on somebody else. Uh, uh, I remember a few years ago, and I think Dave was involved in, uh, in, in the Taiwan Strait scenario, using Air Force bombers to, uh, to sink 
enemy ships. Uh, how do we how do we start taking advantage of the, of the other guy's capabilities? And uh, same thing in the Straits of Hormuz, using army helicopters to go against the, the swarm boat attacks. So I, I do see movement in that direction. I think that there are, uh, as the budgets continue to get constrained, that uh, new ways of doing business, ways of taking advantage of other people's capabilities is gonna be uh, very high on the list. Yeah, I'd just add that uh, you know, there, there are some uh, there's evidence of the services moving in this direction. One of the examples is the memorandum of agreement that the Air Force and the Navy signed on a Global Hawk and BAMS operations, where the Navy uh, uh, actually capitalizes on the logistics uh, infrastructure, the basing, and the training that the Air Force had already established for the Global Hawk program. Um, that's, on, that's not only smart operationally, uh, but again, on the part of the Navy programmers, it's smart, smart fiscally because we've already spent the money. Uh, so, you, you know, there are opportunities here. And if there's any one good thing that's going to come out of these fiscal constraints, uh, you know, to paraphrase the famous Winston Churchill quote, you know, gentlemen, we've run out of money, so now we have to think. Uh, it will probably eventually force the services to begin to focus on their core functions and move toward this notion of interdependency as opposed to self-sufficiency that many battle commanders try to achieve because they want to have sole control of all the assets. Well, not only is that not the smartest way to do business, it's also the most expensive way to do business. So we have to move forward uh, in the context of not just smart resource uh, 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 acquisition of capability, um, but real true joint operations, um, as a General Estes uh, alluded to. Now, right now, at the very beginning stages of this budget crunch, you see the services doing what I call the turtle mode, um, as General Estes alluded to. They kind of pull in and they want to protect everything. I think that's a stage. The next stage is going to be um, a greater realization that, you know, Maybe we ought to focus on what we bring to the fight that's unique and not try to capture everything so we can attempt to fight alone. You know, and I'm gonna fold in a little bit of uh, a part of some of what one of you asked, and that is uh, we've talked about trying to build uh, and procure things based on capability than in, rather than buying, buying individual weapon systems. Is there any hope uh, as we look to the future in your estimation, either one of you, that, that think buying a capability that both services may need makes some sense? Could we get common agreement on that? Or is that a stretch? Let, let me jump in here because, <laughs> you know, this is, this is an area that's rife with, with, with uh, uh, different perspectives and controversy. But the short answer is, yeah, we, we, we are doing some things smarter. Uh, and I'm going to use a, a program that's kind of come under all kinds of attack as an example, and that's F-35. But if you look at F-35 in the context of not just an F, you know, the next best version of an F-18 or an F-16, um, but rather a multi-role information node that can introduce a whole set of different capabilities that are shared by all the services, that gets to what I was talking about in terms of building a new concept of operations, if you will. Uh, a, a combat cloud where a variety of the systems from whether they're on the sea, under the sea, on land, in space, in the air, can all join together and plug and play uh, uh, to accomplish ISR, share the information. It's not just about force application, but it's about turning data into information and then information into knowledge. So when you think of systems uh, like F-35 in that fashion, you get to see that you know, we're, we're on the verge of being able to do business a different way. But we're constrained by sort of historical and traditional nomenclature in the case of this aircraft. It's an F. 
I would suggest to you that's one of the reasons the F-22 was terminated because the Secretary of Defense didn't understand that the F-22 wasn't just an F, it was an F-B-E-A-R-C-E-W-A-W-A-C-S-22. <laughs> and that we'd value it more for its ability to penetrate contested airspace, collect information, and get it back to the decision makers than we would for its ability to shoot missiles or drop bombs. So, so I think Dave is just giving you a good example of what we're talking about, how thinking's gotta change. We can certainly see it, but the decision makers in the government, and this is one of the issues, we, we constantly are changing people. I mean, I'm not being critical of anybody, but we just changed Secretary of Defense's again, and, and while uh, I'm sure the current secretary is a very knowledgeable guy, he's starting from square one again. And he's got to learn the kinds of things we're talking about. And, you know, you think about, well, let's see, the Air Force has got all these fighters. What do they need all these fighters for? Or the Navy has fighters and the Air Force has fighters. What do they, you know, you got to understand what the heck's going on here. You can't make the right resource decisions. And in, I think in my estimation, and I think there's agreement amongst this group, that if in fact people don't start thinking differently, we're gonna go make the same mistakes and procure the kinds of things we're used to procuring, and we will not be effective in doing the kinds of things we're talking about as adversaries change the way they operate. I mean, they have watched the US, for, US operate uh, in, you know, you can go back as far as Vietnam, you can say Desert Storm, you can say Serbia, you can say Iraq, you can say, um, uh, you can say uh, Afghanistan, and they learn lessons about how the U.S. forces operate, and as, as a result, they develop counters, and that's what this uh, anti-access uh, area denial is all about. They watch the U.S. always deploy forces forward. Well, one of the things to create havoc is to prevent that from happening. So what are we seeing as a panel uh, in the things that we watch? What kinds of things are what we consider to be area uh, denial? What, what, what's going on out there? What do we see adversaries doing to prevent the forward deployment of forces that's creating this problem? Well, first of all, I, I've got to go back to, yeah. to the previous one because okay. I'm not convinced that uh, that joint the way we do joint programs is the right way to do business. When you think of all the programs that have J in front of them, it's hard to find successful ones, maybe JDAM, but after that you go to uh, you know Jitters, Joint Common Missile, Joint JSOW, uh, and all of those had in common a, a joint program office. When you look at space systems, which are truly joint systems, uh, there's one program office, it buys the capability and it seems to work. So I think there's, and I am not an acquisition professional by any means, but I think we've got to get at the way that we procure joint systems. Uh, and I, I think that having a, a single program office that its sole job is to get that thing done uh, is probably the way to go on that. Um, when you go at, at your second part of your question here, which is, um, you know, what are the what are the things that uh, we see doing area denial? Um, when you let's think of Iran for example, Iran would be a a nothing if they didn't have their their missiles and their nuclear program. Um, they can hold the Saudi Arabian oil fields at risk, for instance. They can hold uh, the Straits of Hormuz at risk. And those are real area denial challenges. And it's very hard to get in there and, and find all the mines in the country because there's millions of mines. It's very hard to get in there and find all of their scuds and all of that. So when we start thinking of it, we can't think of it as ones and zeros. We've got to start thinking of, of, of how do we design systems that, that are systems within systems? How do you go from the time that mine is taking out, is, is sitting in its its um, bunker until it gets to the ship, till it gets deployed. And you've got to be able to go after every step of the way on that. And so we've got to start thinking through the, the whole system engineering piece of the, of the process here. Dave? Yeah, let me, uh, um, back to the uh, specific question, uh, General Estes, on what kinds of, of 
of evidence are we seeing in terms of capabilities to deny access? Um, there's a ton of them out there. Uh, DERFM, uh, digital radio frequency modulation jammers. Cyber, you know we're coming under attack every day, uh, but we still sit on policy issues in terms of being able to uh, react. Um, if you look at uh, uh, super cruise and stealth being now not just an advantage of the United States, but also being developed by the Russians and the Chinese. Not that they'll use them, but they'll sell them to other folks that, that may in fact, not may, but will use them. If you look at uh, ballistic missiles you, that can be used against mobile uh, targets, uh, like uh, ships at sea, those are all examples of uh, anti-access uh, systems. Uh, and, and, and it's not just the systems per se, um, it's what I was talking about in terms of different means of denying uh, an opponent an advantage. How many of you all are familiar with the publication Unrestricted Warfare? Some of you are. Um, it was, and I can't see very well, so maybe more of you are. But it was a document that was written and published by two Chinese Air Force colonels in 1999. Google it and then go read it. It's, you know, it'll take an hour and a half, two hours to read. But it talks about different ways, Sun Tzuian ways of accomplishing uh, uh, an opponent uh, like the United States, preventing an opponent to accomplish its objectives. So that's another way of uh, denying access. Um, any, any, any come back? L let me pick up on another uh, theme that's in the comments from all of you out there. Uh, you know, it's, it, it sounds real uh, easy. It rolls, sort of rolls off the tongue with the defense budget cutting back. We've still got all this a very complex world out there that the U.S. needs to be dealing with, with its allies in terms of protecting uh, uh, our strategic interests. Um, as budgets are decreased, it's easy to say, well, we've got to find a different way of operating. But the fact of the matter is, you can't do more with less. You're going to do less with less. So how the heck do we deal with this complex world that we have with a budget, defense budget going down as significantly as it is? We've already said, well, we've got to find new ways of operating, but how in the world are we going to deal with this very complex world? Have you got any, any thoughts about that from a macro standpoint? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things here. The, the hardware that we're buying today is going to last us 20 or 30 years. Uh, you know, if you think of a ship, I mean, it could last even longer than that, and aircraft are certainly going to last that long. And so uh, it's very hard to change that overnight. That's going to that's gonna take time. But the things we can change are, one, our operational concepts, which we've talked about today, uh, and how we fight as, you know, how we fight as a joint force. And... Um, Today, we tend to fight very much in our own lanes as, as Navy, as an Air Force, as, as an Army, as a Marine Corps. And um, I think that's the piece that we're trying to get at here is that uh, uh, Dave has talked about fighting, a, you know, the, the ISR strike complex. Uh, how, do you, how do you set up and, and if that's truly how you want to fight, how do you organize around that? Um, and a lot of it's going to take the individual service personalities out of it and put the uh, put it to a more joint fight. Um, and so I, th I think that's what we're getting at is that we've got an awful lot of capability out there. There's a few things that we might need uh, to add to that capability, but we've really got to fight smarter instead of uh, going out there and doing a binge buy. So I guess for the audience here, you know, and especially those, uh, I mean, many, obviously, many of you from industry, you're looking for what, what is it we ought to be doing? Where should we be investing? How can we help? And what I hear you saying is, and it's very true, we, we've got what we've got. We've got to learn to use what we have better. Let me and, give you an example. So, example from the late 30s, early 40s. Many of you are familiar with it. But you know what? The Germans, the French, and the Brits all had tanks, radios, and airplanes. But what did the Germans do? They came up with a concept of operations called Blitzkrieg that beat the crap out of those two opponents initially. 
okay, until the industrial might of the United States spun up and we came over and you know the rest of the story. But that's a great example of having the same stuff but coming up with different concepts of operation. I would, I would push back a bit because, and I understand, it, if, if, you, you, if you do business the same way, yeah, with less resources, you're not gonna be able to do the same amount of stuff, but there are ways that you can do more with less. And let me give you one example. It's in the realm of intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. Uh, right up front, let me just tell you where I'm coming from. Technology is not really a problem. Yeah, we have technological challenges we're trying to overcome, we'll get there, but today, the greater problem is what I call social science and the organizational challenges that we've, that, that we've put in place that inhibit change. We have all these stovepipes that we need to get beyond and achieve greater integration. Here, so here's my example. You know, if you look in the intelligence world, we tended to build organizations and do uh, processing, exploitation, and dissemination from different modalities. So you have imagery over here, NGA, you have SIGINT over here, NSA, uh, and then maybe somewhere along the line, someone will bring them together and go, oh, hey, look, you know, maybe this indicates that. Well, how about doing real-time sensor-to-sensor tipping and queuing? Um, what does that do for you? I did a little research, uh, and the Defense Science Board did a study in 2008. They talked about the performance potential of integrating data from different sensors in platforms and that it's enormous. Here's what they estimated, that the signal to noise improvements over the performance of a single sensor is four to eight dB greater. Factors of 10 reductions in convergence and identification times of a particular uh, target and as much as 100 times better geolocation accuracy achievable through multi-sensor integration. So what's holding us up from doing that? We're doing it in small degrees, but our organizational structures uh, are inhibiting that kind of integration, and that's where we need to move. Uh, by the way, you might say, well, okay, how do you do that? It takes leadership, commitment, and more leadership. I got an eye on the time. Yeah, we got a couple of minutes left. So uh, uh, there's a j couple of people have asked this question, so I feel obligated to at least throw it out here. And that is, as we deal with these kinds of issues that we're talking about, we're organized in services, and we know for at least modern times how that operates and what it leads to. Is it time to think about organizing differently if the budgets have reduced so significantly, if they really do come down? Do we need to think about organizing differently to be able to procure things to deal with areas, uh, threats? Uh, uh, is there a different way to put the military together, I guess, is the question. What do you think? I, I th my answer is yes. And when you look at, um, you know, the, the Navy was set up around battle groups, the Air Force set up uh, around expeditionary wings, mid-90s, I think, Dave, is that right? right? And uh, the Army is starting to move to brigade combat teams. So you're seeing a, a slow evolution towards the idea that you've got to task organize. And if you don't train that way, uh, it's very hard to go into a fight and execute that way. So uh, the services have now each done it within their services. Now I think it's time that you now fold that together into a bigger concept where you have uh, you know, an expeditionary group that's made up of, of all of those elements that's able to, to go and employ uh, when they need to. And, um, you know, will we ever f fight another ground war? Everybody says no. We probably will sometime in the future. The laws of uh, probability say we will. Uh, you know, where we, we weren't going to do anything after Afghanistan, then we went into Libya. Uh, now we're on, North Korea's hammering at the door. So um, how do you get a force that's ready to go and not have to do the, the you know, seven month run up to Desert Storm or the, I don't know how many month run up we had for, um, uh, for Iraq. Uh, how, do we, how do we make that happen? And I think that's what we're trying to get at here. Dave? Dave yeah, just a couple of comments on, you, you know, our joint concept of operations is a very, very good one. Unfortunately, not too many people inside the Pentagon and most certainly 
on the other side of the Potomac in the Congress understand it. Let me just take a minute to describe it because what we need to do is apply it in reality and we haven't necessarily over the last 10 years. The services don't fight. The services organize, train and equip and provide components to a joint force commander who does then take each of those service components and assembles them in a way to best meet the needs of his or her contingency. And each one of those is going to be different. So we need to have the strongest Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps in the world because it takes 25 years to acquire the competency to learn how to dominate in those domains. So you can't get rid of the services. You don't want to get rid of the services. But what you want to do is build joint structures and commanders who understand that there are different and varying elements that you're going to be able to have access to to meet the needs of a very different contingency. But you need to also understand that integration and then organize that way. And then train. That if, and then train that way. Yeah, and but I, if you look back at Iraq, where was Joint Task Force Iraq? We didn't have one. We had multinational core Iraq. Core? What do we do in organizing as a core? We didn't have joint task force Afghanistan. We had US forces Afghanistan, but no components inside that structure. So we have the doctrine. What we need to do is put it in practice. Yeah, and I'd say for this audience here, you know, we've talked about the four services, but there's really a fifth piece to this, which is going to be cyber, and it's going to keep growing in the future. And if that is not integrated into the operational and tactical level of warfare, um, it, we're, we're going to end up with, a, with the left hand, right hand, not knowing what's going on. And we're going to get effects that we don't know what, uh, what they are. And so somehow that leg of the, uh, of the stool has got to get played into the, into the man train and equip piece so that uh, it, it flows into the uh, into the into the battle. Space. That's a topic for another whole conference all on its own. Yeah, yep. exactly. It's long overdue. Well, listen, our, our time is up. Uh, Admiral Fitzgerald, General Deptula, thanks very much for your participation in this panel. We've tried today to raise some new issues, some to bring some different thought uh, to some things you might not normally hear at a space symposium because we've got to start talking about this stuff. We get very focused on space here. This is the space symposium. We understand that. But there's an integration of capabilities here that have got to come together, at least from the defense standpoint. And I recognize this, is, this symposium is much broader than defense. Uh, and we need to keep talking about those other aspects, the civil and commercial sides as well. But to further the dialogue on the defense side, we've tried to give you some other things to think about today. Uh, and hopefully, uh, We'll continue this dialogue in future symposiums. Thanks very much for coming today and enjoy the rest of your time.